So hi everyone, welcome to our second virtual field day. Um, it's part of a series and our response to social distancing. I'm so excited to see so many of you here. Um, you have to kind of imagine that we're all stood in a field in Berkshire. So I've tried to recreate that for you here. It's, it's now June actually. Um, and yeah, just try and, try and make the most of, of this opportunity. Um, my name's Katie Bliss. I'm an agroecologist and I work with the Organic Research Centre um, as a researcher on the Innovative Farmers Group on Intercropping in Arable Systems um, and also work with the agroecology team. Um, so this, this meeting was actually originally intended um, as an intercropping field lab meeting um, and that if, for those of you that are not aware, Innovative Farmers um, is a network of groups of field labs um, that focus on specific questions um, on specific topics um, so groups of farmers that come together to, to tackle those together and um, do on-farm trials and share share those experiences and um, so we're a group of around 25 farmers that are trying various different mixtures um, including cereal legume mixtures um, oil seeds and companions um, and also living mulches um, although there is now another innovative farmers group on living mulches, so do check that out if you're interested. Um, and David and Richard Case both are members of that group um, and were hosting an on-farm event today in theory um, and have really excelled themselves to be able to take us out into the field today. Um, so really looking forward to that. Um, I don't know if anyone's, can we pop into the chat? Um, David has made a website to um, give you a bit of a virtual farm experience. Um, and then we've got Richard who is out in the field who's going to be sharing us that on video as well. Um, so we're also looking forward to hearing from other members of the group, so Andy Howard and Adrian Hares, and also other on farm trials um, in Remix and Diversify. Um, <laughs> It's been a real opportunity to kind of open up this group and um, bring in what other on-farm and um, research trials are happening across Europe actually so it's fantastic to have so many of you here um, and encourage you all to join in the conversation and um, share your own experiences and ideas and um, so you can write in the chat there I'll explain a bit more about that later um, so yeah, the, the plan for today really is we've got around 35 minutes with David and Richard to show us around some of the trials at Sonning, um, both intercropping and also around diverse rotations. Um, and then we'll share some of the insights from last year's trials and, and this year's trials with, from the group. And then invite others to share their own experiences and open up for questions and discussions. Um, so before we get started, a few technical bits, um, just in case anyone is like us and still getting the hang of Zoom. Um, firstly, yeah, so if you, this is our second one, I should say as well, so be prepared for mild teething problems. It's all a bit of an experiment, but it's all good fun. Um, so if um, you, yeah, so we are recording. If you want to ask any questions, you're on mute, but you can write in the chat. So at the, on the bottom bar there, there is a chat button. If you click on that, you can message everyone um, and put your question on there. So do pop them on there as they come to you and we'll, we'll pick up a couple as we go along and then we'll, we'll pick up most of them at the end. Um, also comments, your own experiences, feel free to, to pop it all in there. Also, if you see someone in here, you know you can send them a direct message and say hi as if you were chatting at the back of the room. Um, so feel free to do that. Um, I should also say we are recording. So um, if, um, if there's for any reason you don't want to have this shared, this so we can share it afterwards, then, then do let us know if you want us to cut that out. Um, but yeah, don't be, be free, pop your questions in there. Um, if you're on the phone, um, you um, can dial when, when if you want to ask a question, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine, and we'll pick that up at the end. Um, and star six will mute and unmute yourself. Um, and just quickly to say that at the top there's a bit that says speaker or gallery view. If you put it in speaker view, that will mean um, as we're going around the farm, you'll be able to see Richard, um, and you'll see the people that are talking. Um, so. Uh, that's that. There's our agenda. Um, 
we will aim to finish on time at 1.30, um, but we, uh, sorry, at one o'clock, but if anyone wants to stick around afterwards, we will um, still be here and we can have a, take a few more questions and just have kind of informal discussions, general chin wag. Um, so feel free to stick with us. Um, as I mentioned, we're part of the Intercropping Field Lab um, and if anyone wants to learn more about that, um, we can talk about that later as well and I will send around the details of how to get involved um, with this group or, or any of the other groups that, um, that Innovative Farmers are running. Um, so I'm aware that we're, we're quite a mixed audience um, and some of you on here may be completely new to intercropping and some of you have been innovating with it for years. Um, so we try to seek a balance with that, um, but I think it'd be fair to say that, that all of us are still learning and learning from each other. So it's fantastic to have so many of you here. Um, by means of a quick definition, I'm going to use Andy's, um, who is going to be talking later, um, which is the growing two or more crop species where part or all of their crop cycle overlaps temporally or spatially and when one or more component of species taken to harvest. So within that definition, we're, we're bringing in things like companion cropping and relay cropping as well. Um, and the crux of it really is that nature doesn't have monocultures. Plants in monocultures have um, similar traits and compete for the same resources, whereas plants in species mixtures can have divergent and sometimes complementary traits. So we're looking to enhance these beneficial interactions between crop species um, for key functions, including things like um, suppression of weeds, scaffolding, reducing pest pressure, and looking to kind of balance these facilitative effects with, with competition. Um, so yeah, delighted to have you all here um, and look forward to, to hearing from, from David and Richard and Adrian and James and all the rest of you as well. So I'll pass over now to David. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to bring up a 360 uh, degree view of the site and while I do this Richard will give an overview of what we do here and uh, yeah just give an introduction to the research site we have here. Okay, <clears throat> am I on? Yeah, you're on. Jolly good, jolly good. Um, just want to say welcome to Sonning Farm. Um, Sonning Farm is one of the University of Reading's um, farms. The uh, University of Reading has around 800 hectares of farmland. Um, the main, the main air, uh, farm is uh, 580 hectares over at Shinfield where they have a big dairy herd. Um, Sonning Farm, where we are now, is uh, 180 hectares, uh, mainly comprising of um, pasture and forage for the, uh, the dairy herds young stock but also some arable. Now um, if David can just swing around to Woodlands field we have a dedicated field for um, for doing crops research. Uh, it's 12 hectares uh, managed in a, a four-year rotation so one year we will run crop trials and then for three years the land will be put back to um, a coxfoot and clover mix uh, just to give the land time to even out over that three year period before we put trials back in again because obviously once you've had trials in a in a plot it will become quite uh, variable and we're trying to cut down on variability now included in that 12 hectare site um, if David can just move his mouse to the organic rotation. So um, in the center of it, we have a six year organically managed or simulated organic uh, ro rotation. Um, and that's been running since 2003. Um, and the purpose is, is to do um, organic trials, but right next to um, conventional so we can have a direct comparison side by side. Obviously it's not certified organic but uh, we're trying to get as close to that as we can. Um, we are situated uh, just a few feet above the Thames floodplain which has caused issues. Um, so in this last year we did have some flooding which has, has affected some of our work. Now as well as that 12 hectare site we um, 
often borrow land off the farm to do bigger experiments. And um, back in 2013, we borrowed the field next door and uh, we haven't given it back since. Um, and on this site, we're looking at um, more rotational type crops. So on the main site, we've got a four year rotation that we could try and keep, uh, keep going. But on, on the next door field, Broadmoor, um, we're able to run a trial, you know, in a, longer, a longer term trial in one place. Um, so the couple of things you know, we're going to pick out today are the uh, liberation rotations, which are um, looking at different levels of diversity um, in, a, in a, um, a rotational setting and uh, maybe uh, touching on some forage uh, trials that we're looking at and also looking at the place where some of you may have seen last year where uh, David was running his triticalium bean intercrop. Um, so in this year we've, we've just put wheat in the exact position of each plot um, to see what the legacy effect of those intercrop trials is. Um, I think I'll hand back over to David now. Is that what you wanted to know or any yeah, more? That's great. Um, let me just uh, switch my screen over to the PowerPoint. Um, and um, yeah, so just as Richard touched on briefly at the end there, we'll start with the uh, intercrop legacy or legacy intercrop. Um, and that, uh, as Richard said, was where I did a triticale bean experiment last year. And just in that top photo, you can see it um, immediately prior to harvest um, with Richard and Caroline uh, preparing the bags to collect the uh, samples. Um, now, after that was harvested, um, yeah, oh sorry, I'll, I'll go back and just explain the results from that very briefly and the premise for that experiment. Um, back in 2017, um, I did my undergraduate dissertation on intercropping triticale and bean. Um, and that was just a, a spring experiment just to have a look at uh, effic um, growth efficiency. So we measured that using land equivalent ratios. Um, which uses the yield from both crop components um, and combining them works out how efficient that would be when compared to growing the two crops separately. Um, if you want, we can touch on that uh, more towards the end. But um, from the, that data, we found that a mixture of 25% cereal, 75% uh, bean, um, those percentages are of the um, sole crop seed rate that was sowed. Um, the 2575 mixture appeared to give the best land equivalent ratio. Um, and so last year's um, intercrop, which is the one you can see in this photo, was just repeating that to see if we'd get similar results. And yeah, we did, um, we did get similar results from that. Um, but after harvest, we went in and put a mustard cover down. And just after we put the mustard in, we noticed there was quite um, a sizable difference in the crop height of the mustard over where the different um, intercrop plots had been. So we thought, well, we may as well see the effect that has on the following crop. Is that as an intercrop isn't just a one-year thing. You've got to put something in the ground the following year. So we wanted to know what effect, if any, that would have on subsequent crops. Um, and at the moment, uh, we haven't really got any data from it because it's not harvest time yet. Um, but uh, we're not entirely sure how much uh, how much that would have worked in terms of nitrogen carry over because as Richard said we had quite bad flooding and in that bottom photo here you can see um, a big patch of water where that was underwater for most of the winter so this area here is completely unusable in terms of the trial 
although fortunately the winter half of the um, intercrop last year hasn't been touched by flooding so hopefully we should get some good results off of that. Um, yeah so after doing uh, triticalian bean for two seasons in a row um, and coming and chatting with the intercrop group um, it was brought up that actually uh, triticalian bean is quite a niche um, intercrop to do you have it's very specific to specific systems and um, I wanted to know well how much of that carries over into other intercrop mixtures um, so this year um, for part of my MSc dissertation I've put in um, a two-year uh, a, a two another two-part experiment um, another winter and spring looking at different cereals um, with one legume which is uh, fave bean and the spring half of the experiment looking at different legumes with one cereal um, which is wheat um, now the winter intercrop um, had uh, a very similar similar um, experimental design so we had uh, four treatments for each cereal uh, intercrop plus a bean sole crop so with three different cereals being trialed in the intercrops that leaves 13 treatments um, including all of the sole crops and those 13 treatments were repeated four times uh, in four different blocks over the experimental area now that leaves 52 plots uh, for me to go through and take measurements from and just for your information as I go through and refer to these different treatments I've always put the cereal part of the intercrop um, before the legume so for example I've picked out the oat 2575 which means that that treatment um, in that treatment the oats in it were drilled at 25 percent of the sole crop seed rate uh, and 75 percent of the bean sole crop seed rate um, very similarly to the that's very similar to the spring intercrop where um, but the other way around in that we've got um, three different legumes that should say uh, instead of cereals um, and with one three different legumes being intercropped with one cereal um, and then again that leaves 13 treatments for each replication with four replications 52 plots with four spare plots of Malika spring wheat um, all of the spring wheat this year is Malika um, again I've put the treatments at the side there um, I think these power this PowerPoint will be made available later on um, but if not and if people want to have a look at those then we'll be happy to share this PowerPoint um, so so far with this year's intercrop um, the spring intercrop has only just really come up so we haven't really got very much data from that but um, we've got quite a bit already on the winter intercrop so I'll just take you through what what's happened so far um, it was drilled uh, back in November um, and it was fleeced straight after putting the pre-emergence herbicide uh, on um, and that's that was to protect it from predation from um, the crows the, uh, <laughs> the pheasants the rabbits the deer and every other living thing around sonning which seemed to really enjoy ruining our experiments um, we unfleeced it in late February once it started growing uh, properly and was really well established and right from the start we started taking um, red far red measurements um, which is basically a measure of how green the area is under the sensor so that looks at how quickly the crops establish um, and spread out and cover the ground 
Um, as well as that, we've started taking light interception readings and these are measured every other week. Um, and of course, the establishment counts to see how much of the seed we put in the ground is actually established. And again, another part of this experiment, which we're really keen to draw out on is the weed, um, the effect intercropping has on weeds, which at this stage is, is fairly marginal. Um, it's just wanted to get an initial indication, although the main weed um, data will come later on in the year when we take our harvest index and separate out the weed matter um, from later on. So just looking at that um, greenness and the red far red, um, the, it was quite a spread of greenness to begin with as the cereals um, sort of came up a lot quicker. They filled a lot more of the ground up, um, whereas the beans were quite small, left a lot of bare patches in the soil. Um, and the plants were struggling quite a bit um, at the beginning of the year with how dry it suddenly went. Um, but then after week three and four, when we had that rain and a bit of warm weather, the beans do what they do um, and they really close the canopy fast. Um, and you can see that um, this red line is the bean uh, greenness. So, sorry, I should have said the higher the number, the less green it is. So they actually started, the air, green area started reducing before all of a sudden we got this um, rain and warm weather and it just shot down. And now it's um, at the bottom here, which means it's the most green. Um, just had a question on that, David. Yeah. Um, what is being used to, to measure that? To measure that? Um, what equipment? I will unmute Richard because he'll be able to explain that better than I will. Okay. Um, we, we've got a um, red to far red reflectance meter. So, um, being as the plants utilize red light and reflect a far red light. If you take the ratio between those two, it gives you an idea of how green the area is. So the ground is much more red, um, so it reflects the red light, whereas the plants will be absorbing it and not reflecting it, so hence the greenness measure. Um, Thank you. Is that all right? Yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, and... After again, after that rain and the warm weather, all of the plants sort of followed the same trajectory in how quickly they um, were greening up. And we're actually now seeing the curve begin to flatten um, as the plants have established their canopy and are maintaining it while um, they produce flowers and start to fill grain. Um, we will continue to measure this. Uh, as it gives quite a good indication as the year progresses that when the plants begin to ripen and senesce. Um, and it can be quite interesting to see which mixtures begin to ripen quicker and which individual um, components of the intercrop um, begin to senesce and die back. Um, and the other thing we have been collecting, as I said, was light interception. Now, We've only done two readings of that so far, and the third reading's due this weekend, so that data hasn't been put in. But I just thought I'd put the um, uh, data labels on all of the soil crop mixtures, plus one standout intercrop mixture. Um, so from that, you can see, as I said, that the beans have closed their canopy now. That red bar was taken um, nearly uh, a week and a half ago. Um, and so that, that's saying that 81% of the photosynthetically active radiation or sunlight um, is being intercepted uh, by the and that's sticking a sensor at ground level underneath the crop and having a sensor above the crop and taking a measurement of the sunlight at exactly the same moment and finding the difference. Um, Interestingly, the, all the uh, cereal sole crops uh, were a lot lower than their intercropped counterparts. Um, and uh, with 
the wheat 25 percent wheat 75 percent bean treatment that was uh, very nearly just as much as the beans um now um i'll come on to the bean and cereal competition a bit later on um but i just thought that was worth noting um for some reason my data graphs haven't been shown on this powerpoint um but if you go on the web website i think i've got the uh the data on there so you can have a look at that later but um the winter establishment um there wasn't a huge amount of difference but there was some in that the beans seemed to establish better when intercropped with wheat and that was even in comparison to the bean sole crop um whereas the oat and the barley seem to have somewhat suppressed the um uh the bean establishment and germination but i think that's something that needs to be tested separately at a different stage so um maybe next year i could do a germination test in pots or something just to see what what is causing that uh, whether that was just a one-off or a fluke um but with the uh oh yeah and with the in terms of the cereal establishment interestingly enough there was a marked increase in the 25 percent cereal 75 percent bean um emergence or establishment percentage um again i don't know what was causing that but that will be something to look into at a later stage um again i'm sorry the powerpoint for some reason isn't showing my uh, um weed counts um the oats did not receive a pre-emergence herbicide um that was because we couldn't find a pre-emergence herbicide that was uh would work on both the beans and the oats without killing one or either of them off um but the rest of the treatments received a uh, stomp and defy um pre-emergence and that was actually really effective in the winter um in the winter half of it um in terms of the difference in weeds between the intercrop treatments the um the bean sole crop had quite a high well relatively high weed count but all of the intercrops uh intercrop treatments had lower weed burden than the bean sole crop so i guess from if you if beans are your main um main crop you're wanting to grow and you're intercropping something into that adding a cereal in um uh, my theory is that the cereal will almost act as a weed but it's a weed that you can harvest and use um rather than something that just gets in the way and mucks up your yield and mucks up everything else um David, i've just had a question um mm -hmm. come through um from roger vickers from the pgro in terms of the actual plant numbers established and um actual seed rate sown for, for, the, for this one uh is that, or is that what was in the Figures. Then, no, the figures were just a percentage. Um, I'm not we can send sure I have afterwards. that on to hand. Yeah, yeah I'll, I can put that together and send around afterwards. Um, um, right. I don't know why. Bear with me a second. I'm just going to come out of. Um, this um sorry i'm just going to reopen my powerpoint because for some reason it's got rid of all of my illustrations um yeah that's sorry again don't worry we're all learning here <laughs> <laughs> We've had one question come through just to give you something else to do. 
Um, John Paul mm. is asking what the drilling date was of the 25 serial, 25 serial 75 mix. Um, the drilling date will have been the same for everything. So we drilled them everything exactly the same uh, time. Great. Um, this seems to have been come through a bit better. So I'm just uh, and then we've had another question around the end use of the crops. Um, mm -hmm. The it's it, are you thinking livestock feed or are you thinking it's a potential for separation? Um, well, that depends on what you need it for um i guess and that's kind of why i wanted to do the different cereals is to see what uses it you can have out of it i mean um andy will probably talk about um they i think he separates his intercrops um sorry let me just start from this slide um can you see those graphs now yeah um, yeah um andy I, th I think separates is using a spiral separator, um, which is something we haven't got here. But I mean, we use just use sieves to separate um, the uh, intercrop. So you can separate it if the grain is good, or if you're just wanting to add new nutritional value to your feed, if you're feeding it to livestock, then um, it can just be harvested together, left, and then milled all, all as one. Um, so I think it's it will be down to individual farmers' needs, whether they separate it or not. But the technology is there to separate it. I don't think that's a massive issue um, at the moment. Um, I just wanted to show you something that I've been noticing recently, especially as the plants are really starting to grow fast, is um, across all of the different cereals, one of the things we're worried about is um, the winter beans overshadowing all of the intercrop because once they do form a canopy they can form it really well and just smother the um the cereals in there for light but actually having gone and i pulled out a representational plant from each treatment in block one and going from left to right you can see uh, the different treatments so that from left to right, we have a 25% cereal, 75% bean, a 50-50 mix, a 75% cereal, 25% bean, and a 100% cereal, and this is of barley. And so as the proportion of beans increases, to me, it looks like the general health of the crop also increases. Now, um, I mentioned earlier if your main crop is beans and you're just wanting to add a little bit of cereal in there um, then that's great that'll mop up the nitrogen but also I mean I'm not sure for sure uh, for definite on this because I haven't got the yield data yet obviously but if your main crop is cereal um, what happens if you just throw a few beans in there um, and like it might improve the efficiency of the crop it might add a bit of feed value if if that's what uh, the end product's going for um but i just thought it was a nice illustration of how effective the cereals are of mopping up that excess nitrogen that is around absolutely um, and you can see the difference in the tillering there yeah. and we have had a couple of questions around that so william waterfield asking if you have any till accounts and then that there appear, yeah there appears to be less tillers on the 25 mm. 75 no, unfortunately, I haven't got any tiller counts because I just don't have time. So if people want to come and count tillers, they're absolutely <laughs> more than welcome to. Um, and that would be greatly appreciated. But, uh, but anecdotally, no. it definitely looks like yeah. there's a difference and, in the growth habit there, doesn't it? And the thing is that that's consistent for all of the cereals. So um, this is all from the first block, from one block. And that isn't me just picking out the shortest plant I could find to get my point across that's going to the middle of the plot and finding as representative plant as possible from the cereals and um, I think what I will do is as the flag leaf start to appear um, and the barley already has um, I'll I'm going to try and take 
uh, flag leaf samples just to get disease, disease scoring because um, while I was down there it did look like there might be some difference in that but um, that's just um, yeah that's not definite for the moment but that's something that I'd like to like to have a look into. Um, so moving over onto the spring intercrop side of things, um, as Katie mentioned earlier, one of the things intercropping is useful for is scaffolding. And I just thought um, this photo at the top was quite a good illustration of how um, that scaffolding works. So here you've got the one of the pea plants already reaching out and grabbing hold of um, the wheat. And the idea being that as those plants grow up together, um, the wheat surrounding the legumes um, will just hold it all together and keep it upright and just form more of a structure. Um, but yeah, one of the problems we've had with this experiment though is when the pre-emergence was applied, um, it was still very dry. So that was applied just before we had all of that rain. So um, it wasn't the most effective uh, pre-emergence herbicide. Um, and the establishment counts haven't really shown any difference. So I haven't put any slides up there, although they've been hovering around the 75% establishment. Um, and the only other thing really that I've noticed is that the rabbits and deer really enjoy eating the lupins, which is quite frustrating. Um, but yeah, I think that's a general overview of the intercrop so far. I just wondered if um, Richard, you have anything um, you'd like to add to that or show us? Um, I, do you have a do you have me on picture? Can you see? I'm just going to stop sharing my sc screen, so that should come up with your screen. Right. Um, uh, only to say, reiterate what you've said. I mean, one of the issues we do have um, when having small plots like we do is that um, we can get quite a bit of predation uh, by rabbits, deer. The crows are probably the worst. Um, and uh, so I was going to show you in the lupin plot here. Um, can see in if you the can just keep your camera as steady as possible so the video has time to catch up. Right. That's good. So we've got a little loop in there and he's had his head chewed off. So um, yeah, that's, that's one of the issues we have. Um, but otherwise, it, it seems to be coming up quite well. Mm. Um, did you want me to, to particularly show anything, David? Or? Um, well, if there's anything down there you think would be of interest to people. Um, then go for it. I mean, yeah. Katie, do you want to see anything? So these are the um, spring intercrop plots, five meter plots, um, drilled with a um, a Hagee plot drill. Um, uh, and adjacent to that, we've got the uh, the winter intercrop plots. Um, and any initial kind of observations there in terms of differences between the treatments? Um, maybe, Dad, if you could go over to one of the 75 bean 25 wheat where the beans look like they're um, out competing the wheat just to show what I meant by that. Um, let me just find one hang on 75 a 75 25 is it or the other uh, way around? 25 75 25 75 right so Second row, uh-huh. Let me just come over this way. Yeah, okay, so, I don't know if that's clear, but um, whereas the wheat was ahead of the beans earlier in the season, 
the beans have now um, shot up and are overtaking the weed. Now these are, are they wizard beans? I think they're yeah. wizard, um, which are quite tall. Um, so, you know, perhaps we should have used a shorter bean and a taller wheat. Um, but um, you can see the, the issue with that. Very good. Um, did you want to start heading over to uh, Liberation? Yeah. Um, and I'll just give a, an overview of um, some footage and I'll let that play while I just describe what, what's going on. So, um, yeah, in front, just in front of the car, um, you've got where the uh, interlake is and they have all of these forage plots and that's what we briefly mentioned um, on earlier. Um, and those are the uh, legacy plots. So the idea being that they'll have two years worth of forage uh, mixtures on and then after those two years will be that we put into an arable um, crop. And we'll just have a look at the effect that those forage mixtures have had on the um, subsequent arable plots. Um, yeah, I just, yeah, while uh, Richard's making his way over to the next experiment. Um, well, the, the, one of the other trials we've got in this field to the left um, is the oilseed rape plots. Um, I'm sorry, this is being a bit jumpy and that's suddenly moved. Um, but yeah, so what you're seeing now is the liberation. Um, and all of those bits of fleece are were put down again to stop any predation uh, happening as the spring crops come up. So um, those, those fleece were only in place for uh, a week and a half, two weeks. Um, and that was plenty enough time for the crop to get ahead and um, get away from the, the pests. Um, and just panning around, you can see um, the whole of liberation um, and the farm area around it. So um, the field where the cows are in that completely flooded this last year and the top half of liberation did as well um, although that's come back quite um, quite well um, yeah in a moment you'll see one of the ways that we get the uh, that we're able to do all of these this plot work and some of the machinery we use um, uh, so yeah we have extended axles on a small tractor which allows us to travel over the plots without damaging them and then on the back of that tractor we have a mounted drill or plot drill that can be used either with cultivars to drill the crop or um, as Caroline's on the back of it doing at the moment she's fertilizing it so that will very accurately drop um, fertilizer over the entire length of the plot um yeah are you in position richard i am somewhat yeah <laughs> grand okay i will stop that and i will go to a different screen so we have had one question come through actually david if i can interject mm -hmm. um around with the slow winter bean establishment in the mixtures does there appear to be higher weed burdens um Slightly higher, although the pre-emergence was quite effective um, in keeping that weed burning down. But even with that pre-emergence, yeah, we have seen a higher uh, um, weed burden in, in the beans. Um, but again, it'll be interesting to see any differences later on in the season, closer to harvest, uh, what that weed burden is as yeah. the weeds grow. Um, well, so... We're out of time almost, David, as well, just to let you know. All uh, right. So quick whistle stop tour, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Can you can you hold it somewhere there? Yeah. Uh, uh, um, 
Yeah, just just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about um, what we call the liberation rotations. Um, these all came out of the um, cap reform and diversification rules that farmers are having to follow. And um, the purpose of of this rotation was to um, to quantify um, different levels of diversity. So to quantify the value both in terms of yield but also um, soil uh, issues with the soil and with um, environmental things like service providers insects the bugs and beasties that actually um, help us in our farming and um, part of that is also because you know we're, we're getting squeezed tighter and tighter in terms of um, agricultural inputs and looking at how the different rotations can um, uh, can can perhaps address some of these these issues. Um, so basically, what what we've got is uh, obviously with with a rotation, you, you there's a there's a problem with looking at it because by its nature, a rotation follows one year after the next, and uh, and as every year is different, um, it's difficult to get an even picture of what's actually going on because the weather. The differences in weather can make a huge difference difference in your your cropping. So what we've tried to do here, if you see all the little squares, is to get every stage of the rotation um, in every year. And uh, also, you know, if you've got a, a, a field producing um, one one rotation, the next rotation could be miles away, and and differences in soil. So um, we've got every rotation in every year and we've got three different rotations running side by side um, every year. Um, so there's, there's, I say there's three rotations. We've got a, a very basic rotation which is three cereals followed by an oilseed grape. Uh, we've got a, a medium rotation which is um, wheat followed by beans followed by winter barley followed by oilseed rape and then we've got a, a rotation that it just pushes it more diversely um, and uh, if, as we're sort of lacking in time I'll just take can you switch to my screen David uh, yeah let me stop sharing yeah um, I'll just stand in the middle of the diverse rotation and and run through what we're doing here um, so the other ones are fairly standard but uh, with a diverse rotation, what we're just trying to, to push the, uh, the amount of things we can get into each part. So um, this part is the wheat, and uh, down in the base of the wheat, we um, have tried to, tried to include um, some legumes. I don't know if you can see that. Um, so we, we broadcast uh, yellow trefoil and white clover in the spring. We've had varying success with that. First year it was very successful, uh, but I, if anyone's got any clues on how to get this stuff to establish, I, I'd be really grateful to know how you do it. So we've really pushed it this year. We've we put one on early and harrowed it in. We've put another bunch of seed on recently because I'm determined to get some legume into this base, but I haven't been terribly successful with it. Um, after the wheat, um, we come round to what is supposed to be a winter bean crop. Sadly, the crows had every single last bean. Um, literally every bean was taken out, just a bunch of holes. So we've replanted with spring beans and fleeced them. The reason we didn't fleece in the autumn is we'd all done our backs in. So it shows that the fleecing is essential when you've got small plots. Because I think the crows learn um, that this is where the food is. They just come down like a horde, and that's that. Um, following the beans, we've um, got a barley crop to lead us into the, the oilseed rape in the winter. And just to push the, the diversity a bit, we have included um, a pea intercrop with the barley. So it is 100% barley seed rate, so 400 seeds per meter squared here. And uh, we've included a half rate of peas as an add 
mix with it. And this is, this is only the second year we've done it. Um, last year didn't work very well, um, again, because of predation. Um, but this year we fleeced it and we seem to have quite a good little crop going. Um, and then finally, uh, this is supposed to be winter oilseed rape. Again, the pigeons nobbled it, so we've put um, we've put uh, a, a crop of mustard in there just to make sure we've got a brassica in there. Um, it does sound like it's a bit of a catalogue of errors, but um, in the uh, we've been running this since 20, 2013, 14, um, and um, generally it, it works fairly well. That first year, 2013, 14, we had a lot of flooding, um, which David can just demonstrate, I think, um, with my little swan. But uh, this year, you know, we, we drilled very late. It was late, or late November that we actually got this crop in. Um, so I actually don't think we've done too bad considering. But um, in terms of results, I was hoping to have uh, one of the PhD students who was originally running this trial speak, but she wasn't able to. Um, so I don't have a really good set of results. Uh, that's, that's the kind of problems sometimes you face with the weather. Um, but uh, generally, uh, just looking quickly at, at her thesis, you know, there, there was um, an improvement in yield stability. There was a definite improvement in um, the, uh, the service providers, the, the bugs and beasties that actually help us out. And, um, and there was also an increase in yield. Um, I wish I could give you better details than that, but I currently can't. Um, We're keeping this trial going. Um, currently we've got nobody actually working on it um, but it is it is something obviously in rotations you want multiple years um, to actually see the, the full effects so I think we're trying to take it out to 10 years um, but we could really do with somebody to take an interest in it if there's anybody out there um, and uh, that's probably all I need to say, is it? Yeah. Or does anyone yeah. want to ask? No, that's anything? good. I yeah. think we, if we could move on to Andy, that would be good. Thank yeah. you so much for that, Richard and David. A really interesting tour of what you're up to there. Um, and I think we'll pick up on some of the other questions when we get to the conversation as well. Um, William Waterfield has shared, um, in terms of your troubles with the living mulches, he, he says the legumes will establish next year. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess it's, uh, if you're looking to create that permanent cover. Um, so, yeah, I think we will ask uh, Andy. So, Andy Howard is one of the members of the group and has been trialling various mixtures over the last few years. Um, let's see if this works. Um, can you see those slides? Oops. Yep. Oh. Can I change it? Oh. Oh, hang on a minute. Small technical fail. Let's try again. And there you go. <laughs> Over to you, Andy. Right. Can I? Uh, um, can I change the screen? I think you need to. Click the. There's something that should pop up to say that you can control the screen. Press start, but whatever that means. Oh, there we go. Yeah, okay. that's fine. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I think you've already introduced me in the field lab. Um, I'm just going to go through what we did last year um, and what we're doing currently this year. Um, it's also it's quite early. Um, so some of the spring established intercrops are um, not very big, um, but I'll talk through why we did them. Um, but this first one we did, this was a diversified trial um, last year, and it was looking at the effect of adding oats as a companion to the establishment of uh, spring linseed. Um, I had noticed 
um, the previous year in my um, linseed crop that where the linseed was with a patch of wild oats and the establishment was a lot better. Um, and so <clears throat> um, last year we did the trial, had nine different plots um, and we did find a positive results in terms of um, yield. Um, not always that much difference in pest damage. Um, establishment was higher. Um, but had 18 to 19% increase in yield where we had companion crops with the oats. Um, the oats were killed out once the linseed was established. Um, <clears throat> and if you look at that field on Google Earth, you can actually see where the with and without the uh, oats is. And um, I can tell you from the combine, it looked a lot better where the oats had been as a companion. <clears throat> so that was a positive result for last year. And this year we've planted some linseed <clears throat> and um, all of it's had oats with it. Um, can you move it on, Katie? It seems to have stuck now. And this is what it looks like this year. Um, <clears throat> thinking about it this morning, I think, uh, not an entomologist, but I'm not sure there's an effect of um, the oats actually deterring the flax flea beetle. It's the flax flea beetle that the real issues for linseed establishment. They chew it away and kill the plant. Um, I think um, from doing this for three years that it's just, it's either the oats force the linseed to grow faster in competition um, and the other, and or whether the oats underground are facilitating the growth of the linseed. It's one or the other, I think. I don't think it's an actual um, the oats aren't necessarily deterring the flea beetle because this morning I could see plenty of flea beetle out there, um, but the linseed is growing fine. Um, just saw a question. Um, I killed the oats out with a um, herbicide, um, being a conventional farmer. <clears throat> so that that was great last year, um, and we've done the same this year. And my personal, I wouldn't grow seed without a companion of oats. Um, it's a high risk crop to get established, um, easy to grow once they're established, but it's getting it to the stage it is now is always a difficulty. Mm. Move on, please. And I guess, uh, yeah, with the, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go on. I was just gonna say, yeah, yeah. Would it be interesting to, with the water traps to look again, like you say, if, if there is any impact on the incidence of, on how many, uh, Flea beetles we can find in the field, or yeah, if there is no impact. Yeah, I can't remember from the results last year. Flea beetles showed a presence. Yeah. Yeah. The, not, um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Sam, why oats? Not another cereal. Uh, because oats are cheap to plant. Um, oats always grow. Spring wheat and spring barley is notoriously rubbish at getting away in the spring. Um, and it doesn't affect um, anything in our rotation. So I seem to find that oats, in all our experiments, you'll see that it's oats that we're using as a companion in all of them, really. Um, rotational reasons, um, easy to kill out. Um, and they all, on, in our situation, in no-till, they always seem to grow, um, where, whereas other cereals can be slow to get away, um, especially in a difficult year. So that's why it works well for us. <clears throat> um, the second experiment was um, peas and all seed rape in the spring last year. This was basically our first intercrop um, with about seven, eight years ago, but we've been growing it for successfully for two or three times. And then in 2018, um, the all seed rape was a disaster, spring all seed rape. Um, and I wondered at the time whether um, adding some oats into the oilseed rape um, was going to um, help the, reduce the flea beetle attack on the spring oilseed rape. So that's why the last year we tried to do it again with, with or without oilseed rape and without oats. <clears throat> um, there was a slight benefit if you're on the next slide. Um, there was a slight benefit from the oats, but really the establishment of the spring oilseed rape um, was poor um, and in the end um, we didn't take the oilseed rape to crop um, 
we only ended up with, I think, in some, I think our best was 12 plants per square metre, um, which was pretty poor. Um, and we've given up on trying to grow spring or seed rape as a companion. Um, it's two, two, three years now we've had issues. Um, and it's, I think it's just, it, it, it comes up, either gets eaten by a slug flea beetle um, and then just disappears. Um, it's just not happy. Um, so unfortunately, we've given up on that. But that's why this year um, we're trying um, oats with peas, which I'll talk about later. <clears throat> um, and this was a trial did with PGRO last year um, with oats and beans or beans with oats. Um, Steve and Roger are on here. So um, this is, this is, I'm doing three experiments with PGRO this year. Um, and we're trying to sort of um, tease out any um, good and bad things on farm. They wanted to do on farm size trials instead of plot trials. And um, last year, this one seemed to show some really good results. Um, the two plots I would point out to you um, would be the second one, which is beads 45, oats 70. That's planted seeds per square meter. And the fifth one, which is Beans 35, Oats 125. Those were the two that really shone out. Um, and I'd also say in plot three with the oats, um, that had 80 kilograms of nitrogen applied as well, and the others had no nitrogen. Um, so you can see in plot five, we nearly got the same yield of oats with no nitrogen, plus some beans. Um, than we did in the sole, sole crop oats with nitrogen. Um, overall, the best was plot two. Um, and it was one of our best gross margins of the year and had an LER of 1.3. And so again, another success. I said the biggest, the biggest um, issue, I guess, with this one last year was possibly wild oats. It's something you've got to be aware of. And um, there was some wild oats. Um, in there, um, but in terms of growth, it went well. Um, and what did amaze us was how few oats it takes to give a decent yield of oats. I mean, there was only 80 plants per square meters established in plot five, um, and how competitive they can be. So you really got to be careful not to put too many oats in the mix. Um, but I'll talk about that a bit more in what we're doing this year. We can move on to yeah, this year. I think year. it's really important they did that um, economic analysis as well. That's something David and I were talking about the other day is just how simple ways of, of doing this. So that was just simply a, the, the cost versus the, the gross income, was it? Yeah, so we took samples. We had combine yield mapped and then um, we took um, three samples per plot out of the combine tank. Uh, and sent them off to PGIRO, who separated them. So we got a ratio, and then we got the thousand grain weight of each one. So we um, so we knew how much of each came from each plot. And I think the plots were tram line plots; they're twenty four meter plots. Um, so it's not one hundred percent accurate, but it's pretty good. Um, it definitely gave the, the ratio. Good Brilliant. ratio. So for what we're doing this year, um, <clears throat> these are the two diversified trials. Oh, Andy Barr, uh, I put it down at £10 per tonne. I think in France they, they cost £20, 20 pound per tonne to separate. Um, but um, with our rotary screen having on farm, I put it down at £10 per tonne. It's fairly simple and easy, um, <clears throat> but it's a, something that's very difficult to cost, I, I find. Um, if you were having to get someone else in to separate it, I think you would, um, the cost would be higher. But because we've got it on farm, um, it, uh, it, I, I put it down at £10 per tonne, <coughs> rightly or wrongly. Um, right, on to this year. Uh, this is one field. The top, the top half is lentils, which is going to be grown for hobmadods, um, for the UK market, and peas and marifats. Um, which are grown on contract as well. Both trials are looking at the same thing, really. Both crops, peas and lentils, can be a pain in the backside to harvest. Um, they can end up on the floor. So what we're trying to do is find um, a companion that will hold up 
the um, peas and the lentils. <clears throat> um, if you move on, Katie, please. So both, both of them are mixed with oats. Um, there's nine plots with different ratios of oats. So what we're trying to do is find the minimum amount of oats um, we need to hold them off the ground. Um, so it's, some of them are very low, but as I said earlier, oats can be very competitive and we don't, we want to lose a minimum amount of yield of the pea or the lentils because they're worth some good, good money and, but also hold them off the ground. So what we're trying to find out is that best economic ratio of not losing much pea or lentil yield, but also be able to keep it off the ground. And you can move on. So that's what the peas look like at the moment. <clears throat> um, that's a couple of days ago. They're growing away well. Can't really see a huge amount with the oats at the moment. It's, it's a bit too early. Um, Observation-wise, nothing really at the moment. Um, I think it's more going to be harvest time as we're going to find the results. Um, we haven't done any plant counts either. Um, these were planted on the 4th of April um, and have come well. Uh, next, Katie, please. And this is the same with the lentils. Um, <clears throat> full rate of lentils and different, rate, different um, amounts of oats just to see um, what happens. I know in Sweden they plant about 70 plants per square metre with their lentils. Um, my worry is that 70 is probably possibly a bit high and might affect the lentil yield which I, I don't necessarily want. Um, so we'll see. Again, it's, um, again, it's not going to be till harvest, I don't think, until, we, um, until we, we know the difference. You can move on to see the lentils. <clears throat> These were, lentils were planted on the 14th of um, April, a bit earlier this year than we have done before. Um, everyone's really learning with lentils. There's not many of us growing them. Um, of, um, what can be done um but when we first started growing them two years ago we thought they were anything would kill them um but they seem a lot hardier uh than we first thought um so we wanted to get them planted earlier this year um to get them away from the weeds and um to get them up and going hopefully yield more the earlier they go in um but we'll see yeah next one Katie? Sorry. Um, so now moving on to the trials with PGRO this year. This trial is basically a rerun of last year's trial with the beans and the oats, um, with the, basically with the uh, monoculture of both. So we've got comparison and different ratios are slightly different. Um, I have planted the rest of the block of land over there and the rest of the field. It was planned to be just oats, spring oats, um, but because the gross margin was so good with a few beans thrown in, the whole block is, is oats um, <clears throat> with a few beans. So I think it's 200 plants per square meter of oats with 25 of beans. And um, they look very well. Um, but again, we'll see come harvest um, what's going to happen with these. They're still there. If you can move on, Katie. It's... Um, they are growing well, they've established well. The interesting thing from last year, as I said before, was the fact that 80 plants per square metre of oats um, gave us five and a half tonne of um, yield. Um, and I was tempted to cut my uh, oat seed rate right down this year, but I was a little bit worried about um, weed competition at that, that low rate. Um, but as you can see on that picture, it's certainly thinner, but the... Um, Oats do amaze me at how well they, um, they fill in the gaps. Um, so we'll see this year whether the 80, 80 plants per square metre of oats was a fluke or whether it's something that's consistently going to show up as, as, um, as a good result. <clears throat> I like the thought of lower plant populations just, just so the plant can express itself. It's not overcrowded um, and also on the ground can express itself. Okay. Move on, but we'll see. The second one, this was um, Steve and Roger's idea from PGRO. Um, 
they are wanting to look at the effect of intercropping on disease, sort of rust and um, chocolate spot in beans. Um, anyone who's grown winter or spring beans know that if you don't keep on top of that, that can completely destroy your crop, destroy your yield. <clears throat> and we're trying to see whether there's any difference having an intercrop in there to the spread of the disease and the, um, how much disease we're going to get in the crop. Um, the only the only one I've come across before is chickpeas and um, chickpeas and flax in Canada. When they had those as alternating uh, rows, they found a massive drop in um, alternaria. I think it was Ascocyta, one or the other, um, in the, in in Canada. So whether it's going to be the same, we don't know. But um, <clears throat> we've got three meter strips. So basically, strip into cropping. If you move on, Katie. Um, on the left there, you've got, far, on the far left, you've got three meter strips of beans and three meter strips of oats. And then straight in front of us is six meter strips of beans and strips, six meter strips of oats. And we've got different um, seed rates of the oats. Um, <clears throat> and this is on some very heavy, not very easy to work um, clay. So in the establishment has been, um, oats are a bit thin in places, but then some of the seed rates is quite low. So I think they, they, they will fill in. Um, the next plot, next, sorry, next photo. This is the alternating rows um, that we did this year by having beans in the front tank of our drill and oats in the back and then blocking off different pipes. Um, it, looks, it looks good. Uh, it looks uh, interesting, but whether it actually produces a a, a benefit um, we don't know yet. We'll find out during the season. Um, I'll be interested to see um, from a personal point of view in terms of intercropping. I like to have everything nearby because they can eat nearby each other because they can interact under the ground just as much as they can over the ground. But if it does give a benefit to disease, then um, it's possibly a way forward. Yeah. Next one. I think this is my last one. Sorry, I, I will take questions. We are going quite fast through a lot of stuff, but as I said, there's not a huge amount to see so far. It'll be harvest time, we'll know more. Um, as Richard said um, in his end of his presentation about getting um, clovers uh, established, uh, we've been trying for about three or four years. Sometimes it works, sometimes it does, doesn't. Um, previously, we've been trying to establish um, undersown clovers in um, oats, um, but we have found that the oats are a bit too competitive. We think um, they can shadow quickly, grow very quickly, and um, shade out the clover. Um, I think other issues we've had is slugs, possibly, and the other issue possibly could be um, residual herbicide from the previous wheat crop the previous year think does have um, a, have um, an effect on the conventional farm because whenever I go and see John Paul or other people organic farmers they seem to get clovers growing pretty well and um, that's one thing one major difference I think is they don't have the um, SUs hanging around in the fields which are affecting um, the clovers um, this is why this year um, this, is, this field uh, has been in grass seed for two years, um, so hasn't had any S residual herbicides for 18 months. Um, so it's just come out of grass seed. Um, last year, I left the grass there all winter. Um, <clears throat> and then um, drilled beans straight into it and the clover went in some of the plots. So that's what we have done. Um, the recommended rate of clover is two kilograms a hectare. Um, from experience, I always we never never got a great um, a great effect, a great establishment for two grams a hectare. So that's why I wanted to try um, four kilograms a hectare just to see if we get a better establishment. And so far, I think we have. Um, what the difference is, I don't know, because we haven't done any plant counts yet. Um, and also the effect of the herbicide, and that was 
Blanco, which is clothidine. Um, I think that it has had an effect on the clover. Whether it's going to kill it, I don't know. But those are the few things we wanted to um, look into. Um, and hopefully that clover will stay there for three or four years. Um, but I think that's a quick run through of what we're doing this year and what we've done last year. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I think there'll be a lot of people interested in that, um, the under sowing trials there, because I think a lot of people are battling with the, the trying to get it established. So it'd be interesting to see the yeah. impact of the herbicides there. Um, Philip Griffiths is asking, which microclaver did you plant? Uh, it's from Oak Bank Game, um, Oak Bank Game, and uh, is it Aber Aberfet? Uh, Aberace, I think is the, I think that's the name of the variety. From, um, yeah, I think that's in the variety. But it's it's just a small, it's a small, small, low growing um, uh, white clover. Right. Yeah. And then John Pawsey is saying that his under-sown clover does suffer from slugs, mainly Setona weevil, yeah. um, which means the one that does the kind of shot holding in the leaves, isn't it? Um, yeah. Essential to get light to young clover plants for as long as possible before the rows close. We've dropped our spring cereal plant populations by 25% to get more light to the clover for longer. That makes, that makes a lot of yeah, sense. Yeah, this is why spring beans stay, probably stay open more longer than... Um, spring cereal so that was another one of our reasons whether i should be going on wide rows on the spring beans possibly um, yeah okay that's yeah. it you can just about see it coming um but it <coughs> it didn't it didn't have much any rain for a few weeks till after it um was planted um but we'll see too early to tell what's actually going to survive yeah and the, the strip cropping looks great. I think that's something a lot of people would be interested in as well. I know we've got Lenora on the phone in the Netherlands who's doing some work with strip cropping in, in vegetables. Um, so perhaps we'll, we'll chat about that a bit later. Um, but yeah, is, are there any, what the kind of practicalities around that? You have three, six meter strips. Um, uh, about to do it on a whole field scale? I guess you'd do it at the header width, wouldn't you probably? Or you just put it all in the combine and and separate afterwards, but if they're in strips, you'd probably try and do it to header width, I yeah. would presume, simple. Brilliant, okay, well, I'm conscious of time. Um, John saying the system chameleon drill helps too, <laughs> with a wink. Um, and um, I just, I thought we'd quickly pick up on the separation thing, because there's been a few people ask about that. Could you say a few things about how you're doing that and how that could be practical for other people as well? Uh, we're using a rotary, rotary marrow, rotary separator. Um, we did the beans and the oats this year, and it's um, we can get the get the oats, uh, the beans, one hundred percent clean. Uh, there's the odd, odd few broken, broken or small bean in the oats, but they've managed, they've gone to the mill and they haven't complained. Um, but I, I need a slightly smaller screen, I think, and we'll get that ninety nine point nine percent clean. Um, but it is something you've really got to be careful when you start mixing. Um, it's one reason that I'm a bit a bit dubious about um, spring peas and spring any spring cereal because whether there's going to be more broken peas than broken beans um, in the cereal, we'll see. That's why I haven't done the whole field. Um, but yeah, it's something you've got to be definitely be aware of. But that's how we do it is by our um, rotary cleaner. You've muted yourself, Katie. And like you say, yeah, so the lentils and oats and, and peas and oats is a new mixture for you to be testing it out. It is, and both the lentil, again, the lentils are going for human consumption, so they can't have oats in either. Mm. So we've got, we've got to be very careful of what we're doing. Yeah. Brilliant. And then we've just got one more question, and that's how did you manage to plant, I guess you've explained that a bit, in terms of how did you manage to plant the beans and oats in single rows across the field? Uh, multiple hoppers on the drill and then blocking off seed pipes um, so yeah I had the front hopper in beans and the back hopper was um, in oats and then I had to reconfigure the pipes and, it, and that's how I did it um, and it seemed to work well and I can also alter the depth of each one if I wanted to as well so I could have the oats going in shallower than the beans if that's what you wanted yeah so that's with the cross slot isn't it yeah, yeah. 
Magic. All right. Thanks so much, Andy. I'm sure we'll pick up on some more of these things a bit later. Um, I've just we've we got Adrian there. Yeah, I can. There you go. Oh, yeah. you're Adrian. Adrian is trading under the name Tessa. Tessa, there you That's go. Just to confuse it's everything with the other Adrian, which I've seen who was there. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All good. Thanks, Adrian. Okay. Um. Yes, uh, as, as the slide said, uh, we're, we're organic. Um, our primary motivation was weed suppression because uh, we're an Oxford clay. We can grow some awesome uh, wild oats in the rotation. It's three years grass, clover lay. Um, the beans, typically the second cereal. Um, so um, as you can see from the slide, our uh, first attempt was um, um, a fairly high seed rate of wheat and uh, a lower one of beans. Um, we saw some we saw some fairly significant uh, benefit, but we decided that we really need to chop back the uh, the cereal quite a bit, and we went back up to our, our full rate of beans. So we're effectively um, interesting comparing David your uh, um, your favoured. Uh, bean wheat um, mixes, 25% uh, cereal, 75 um, beans. Where, where I guess we're probably on about 40. This year we're aiming for about 40% cereal, 80% um, beans. I think so. Um, yeah. No, 40, uh, just 40, to to that, 40, 80. It, it was interesting going back to Andy's results, looking at his. Um, oat uh was it oat bean um mixture that performed the best and just working out the ratios i think that was uh from the slide i worked it out as 28 percent of the sole, sole crop um cereal and 90 percent of the um sole crop bean seed rate and again that seems to match up with my best LERs from the triticale bean mixtures so that'll be interesting this year if again if we get a similar results across all of the different cereals yeah um i say we're, we're doing this on a fairly broad scale so i don't have we don't have as much uh, data um effectively orc have come and done um whole crop um um harvesting and separated out so we've got we've got less data um in terms of uh, just a quick note on on the separation thing and the use, which, which um, obviously we're talking about separating because we're livestock farm, we started off with the plan that we would retain it together and mill it together. Although in practice, obviously, if you've got a target protein for your uh, stock and you've measured your silage, and we've got um, uh, fairly fairly high proportions of legume in the silage actually in in the end we decided that um the easiest thing to do was in fact to separate it we've got we're doing much smaller tonnages we still managed to get our 40 year old uh proctor cleaner to separate it sufficiently well um as you said we end up with a few broken beans in the wheat but um since we're not selling the wheat it doesn't really matter so we're doing something with uh, with lower tech and, and we're happy with the result we're getting um yeah you casey put up that slide there um so yes we've had consistently a lot much less um weed biomass in the intercrop um we effectively i've I, I took the attitude that we were growing wheat rather than wild oats um and it's just we're just thinking well at least uh, we've probably got as much wheat as we had wild oats but at least we can uh, harvest the wheat and use it for something um the um the comment about the wheat quality that that was in a sense spin-off because we we were using malika um it just happened that the first year that we had uh, Malika spring wheat, which incidentally we grow Malika as up, or we have grown quite often Malika sown in the autumn as our, uh, or as our organic milling wheat. Um, we had a Malika crop on the field next door drilled at the same time. So although it wasn't in the same field, 
uh, we did see a, a protein lift, which uh, we fancied was worth having. Um, and uh, um, so that wasn't the main, wasn't a main objective of, of the trial, but it was an interesting, uh, it was an interesting spin-off. Um, you're probably measuring that far more accurately, Dave, with your with your trials. Um, but uh, it seems to be something worth having. Um, anything else that I need to cover, Charlotte? I think that's the main point. So I think it's just, it was quite a dramatic impact in terms of the weed biomass, wasn't it? Like you say, in terms of um, the wheat just taking that niche of the, of the oats. Um, are you, you're doing it again this year? Are you doing it? Yeah, okay. So what we're, do, what we're doing this year is basically we, <laughs> we're giving up on the trial aspect. We're just drilling the whole field because we're, we're pretty well convinced. So it's, you know, stepping up from six hectares to, to the full 18 hectares we drilled as an intercrop. Um, previous years, our objective is always winter cropping because we're, we're having land that we never expect to go on this year, despite an extremely beneficial, um, easy April to establish things. We still didn't uh, get on our fields and drill till the, uh, till the last week in April. So nothing's up yet, but we have drilled um, uh, 180 kilos per hectare of uh, spring beans and um, 100 kilos per hectare of um, Munica wheat again. Um, this year, because we're uh, drilling as two separate operations rather than mixing or using a, a drill with two separate hoppers, it's two passes uh, with a fairly standard time drill on wide spacings. Um, we've gone to wide spacings because we started into into row hoeing this year on other crops, although we won't be into rowing obviously the the uh, the mixed crop. Um, so we've drilled them at two three five millimeters at, at slight uh, slight angle to achieve um, um, some into row effect. Um, we've emphasised drilling the beans deeper and the uh, wheat shallower this year. Uh, previous years we used a contractor, we brought that back in house, so we've we've uh, sort of like focused a bit more on the on keeping the wheat um, drill shallow so that we don't simply hook the beans up um, and uh, just expose them to the crows. Brilliant. Okay, we'll look forward to seeing how you get on. And it's, yeah, as you say, you've kind of gone with that lower rate of wheat, so having seen that it worked this year, um, to have the, that you can get away with that lower level of, of competition with the, the oats. Brilliant. Think, Thank you. I think um, as, a, as a total, just to say, we, I think as a total, we're drilling a, a, bit, a bigger total uh, seed amount of seed than, uh, than either of the other guys. But as I say, we're, we're taking the attitude that we're, we're really after a wee competition. And, at the moment we don't mind paying for it bluntly <laughs> brilliant yeah thank you um, and then i've just got dan from innovative farmers um reminding us that you can download the report for the innovative farmers field lab on intercropping from the innovative farmers website and he's got the link on there so if you want more details on that um thank you very much adrian we do have one quick question around the depth that you drilled i think you did mention that in the end did you yeah, um, the uh, well, I'll talk, yeah, this um, previous years, um, being blunt, as I say, we used a contract for previous years. We told them the, tar the target depth was uh, was sort of like three to four inches of the beans and uh, and less of the wheat. Um, I know this year in our spring crop, we've I'm pretty sure we've achieved three to three and a half inches of the spring beans, and um, uh, we drilled the, the wheat at one inch. Sorry to be inches. Um. <laughs> Great. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm conscious of time, everyone. So apologies to, if, if anyone does need to go. It is now one o'clock. Um, but if you can stay, then, then please do stay with us. We've got a few more people that are going to share about some on-farm trials um, in Diversify and within Remix, and then we will have more, we'll enable you to kind of unmute your microphones and ask more questions. Um, so if I can just invite, if we've got Ali um, out there from James Hutton Institute and in Diversify Trials. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah. 
Brilliant. Hi, it's Ali Carly here um, from the James Hutton Institute and my colleague Adrian Newton's also in the meeting. Uh, thanks for the invitation. It's great to see some familiar faces and names. I um, really appreciate being a chance to, to contribute. So I'm just quickly going to talk you through some of the trials we're doing this year for various projects. And Adrian, please jump in if I've got anything wrong or if I've forgotten something. So um, starting with these, I think, are our winter trials that were, um, are being, so a lot of our work over the past few years has focused on um, how to optimise spring cereal legume mixtures. And um, we've been particularly looking at which, not just which species work well in combination, but which varieties of those species work well in combination. We've got two or three years worth of data now from those small scale trials across different growing seasons. But this was a new project that was started last year, funded by the Mains of Lauriston Trust, which is looking at winter barley pea combinations, which whether there's not so much choice of varieties that we can grow at least up in Scotland, um, but we did have the opportunity to, to trial some new breeding lines that were supplied to us by a contact in the Netherlands. So these trials are looking at a, couple, a number of different uh, winter and uh, winter pea and barley uh, varieties in different ratios because we're not quite sure what the best proportions are to, to mix these. Um, we're also looking at different levels of nitrogen input and we're looking at them in direct drill versus conventional plough conditions. We have two trial sites. Um, one of them was planned to be at a farmer's site in Fife, um, but unfortunately the, the autumn sown conditions were so challenging that we just didn't get the opportunity to sow the trial on the farm site. So we've ended up sowing them both on our own sites because we have two sites. We've got our Barradry farm site and our site, uh, farm site in Vigary. So the next slide, please, Katie. So another trial that we're uh, doing, to, uh, uh, which, is all, which is a spring trial, this is motivated by the interests of um, a number of the members of our field lab group up in Scotland, we're quite, um, who are quite um, well linked into um, the um, processing side of, of, of of cropping. So a number of them are very interested in, in um, growing uh, cereals and legumes for um, baked products and bread making. And one of the questions that we were asked um, by our, our field lab members was what proportion of a legume would be needed to give the nitrogen uplift for wheat, for, um, for particularly for bread making. So although we had looked at various combinations of, of wheat and faba bean in a trial previously, that was back in 2018, where if you remember, it was really hot, dry growing conditions and our trials suffered quite badly under those conditions. So we decided to repeat some elements of that trial, looking at combinations of, of wheat and um, faba bean, different varieties in different proportions. And we've also included alongside that a wheat, a, a barley, sorry, get this right, fava bean and oat in different combinations as well. So again, we're looking at different proportions between 25% and 75% um, um, uh, mixtures. And we're also looking at this under uh, uh, what we're calling low input and high input conditions. So the low input is zero added nitrogen, direct drilling. The high input is, um, we usually use half of the standard nitrogen input because we're growing with a legume and conventional plough conditions. So be assuming we don't have the same challenging dry conditions that we had back in 2018, it'll be interesting to see what proportion of fava bean gives that nitrogen uplift to the, to the wheat. Next one, please, Katie. And the, this one is just a picture of the trial being sown because this was one of the last of our trials to be sown. It's only sown a couple of weeks ago. This is a follow-on project from our work in Diversify where we've been looking at scaling up um, some of our best performing combinations of cereals and legumes and um, spring cereals and legumes where we've seen that they've performed well at smaller scale we've been testing them out at larger scale we did this for two years at our center for sustainable cropping at Balradry farm which is a long-term rotational experiment and this year we've moved this uh, trial out into a nearby farmer's field 
um, where we're looking at um, two different varieties of spring barley. One that we, from, men, from a number of different trials, seems to perform well in low input conditions, that's sassy, and then a commercial, uh, uh, another modern um, cultivar laureate in combination with um, a spring pea variety. And we're looking at those in conventional plough conditions and uh, direct drill. And it's the, the purpose of this platform isn't just, just to um, see how it scales up and whether we can see some of the benefits that we see in small scale, um, if that scales up to large scale. This, um, demonstra this experiment is actually a demonstration site and the intention is uh, under a new project funded by Esme Fairburn Foundation, which is about um, getting information out to, to other farmers. So this, the idea is this would be a hub site that would be um, used for demonstration and open days and events, but also to um, work with school children. So the idea was to have school visits um, and school children come to the field and learn about um, diversification uh, of farming through things like mixed species cropping and understanding some of the potential benefits that can come from that, for example, with beneficial organisms, soil fertility and so on. Unfortunately, because of the current situation with COVID-19, most of those events won't happen this year, but we still have another couple, two or three growing seasons after this year where they should be able to happen. I think that was everything. Did I miss anything, Adrian? keeping quiet <laughs> great well yeah you're trialing some of the same mixtures that we're, we're trialing down here so yeah, it'd be great to to keep sharing what we're finding and um yeah compare the results so thanks for that and yeah great to be getting kids involved with it all as well um have we got robin from siuc on the line Are you there, Robin? I am. Can you hear oh, me? Oh, there you go. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. So I've been asked to talk a little bit about the work um, that, well, I work for SIUC uh, in Aberdeen, and uh, we've worked on intercrops for a, a number of years, and that currently most of our work is through either Scottish government uh, funded work or an EU project called Remix, which was mentioned before. Um, Remix is tending to focus on multiple services from intercrops, whereas the Scottish government work is predominantly based around homegrown protein uh, production. Um, have we got a slide then? Oh, we've got a mix of slides there. So I think one of those is a wheat uh, a pea crop, which was, um, in the remix, we've got um, a sort of central field site, which we, we grow on a small Scott uh, plot scale. So the bottom left hand picture there is basically one of the open events where people came to visit. And you can just about see some beans in the background there. Um, the picture on the right is my hand holding some Scottish grown lentils from the last few years. So we've tried those for about four or five years with mixed success, but in a successful year, we managed to get uh, around about two tonnes per hectare of grain from the lentils. Um, in this case, it's a variety called Anisia, a type of wheat lentil. And the picture at the top is, a mix, is from one of our farms. Um, we have a, a group called a MAC farm, so it's multiple actor participations, which is a big, long name for a group of farmers who are trying to, to grow uh, intercrops and and we've got a, a group set up there uh, basically a self-help group on intercrops um, where they're sharing experience and ideas and the, the, the um, crop at the top there is from near Fockabers um, with a wheat uh, pea intercrop which was being used or so uh, used on the farm for the egg laying hen business. So some of the other work that's going on in Remix is various kind of tools or practical kind of aspects so some of you may have heard of the Oscar toolbox, which is predominantly about kind of green manure type crops, but that's being developed beyond that towards uh, including grain legume characteristics and how you can maybe match, um, match them uh, better or, or the traits better in, in a mixture. Um, there's something called interplay as well, which is basically you creating a bespoke mix based around the kind of services that you really want. So 
partly in your own locality. You know, if you buy an off-the-shelf mix, it won't necessarily work as, and do everything that you want it to do. So looking at, you know, you know your soils and your climate better, and then you know particularly what you're wanting as, as an end surface, whether it's uh, yield or quality, protein, energy, or soil health, which is one of the key things that the map farmers, the participating farmers particularly interested in, is actually trying to improve the soil health. Um, some work, work as well in the remix uh, from a Danish company and some French uh, colleagues who are particularly looking at how best to set up uh, combines so that you get the, the best quality and you're not damaging various grains. There's quite a bit of work on, on that and that should hopefully come out um, in the next, well, in the next year. Um, and there's also a wiki site as well, which is open to everybody and that's being developed all the time uh, with examples from across Europe. Uh, including the UK, um, with basically loads and loads of information about different types of mixtures that are being used uh, and basically all things intercrop. So I think I've probably used up my three minutes or four minutes or whatever I was allocated. Mm -hmm. but, um, yeah. Great. Thanks so much, Robin. And yeah, really interesting to hear about the, the decision support tool. And yeah, I think it's that could be useful to people in terms of finding what might work on their farm as well as kind of obviously trying it out on small areas. Um, I think, yeah, we are over time. So obviously if anyone does need to get going, please do. Um, and we will be sharing this afterwards on the website um, and you'll be able to, to watch it there. Um, but if we've got any more questions, I know we had a couple of hands up earlier. Um, so we'll just open it up more now if anyone's got things they want to ask. Um, I think we had Kevin Duncan had a question earlier. I don't know if you want to raise your hand uh, if you want to ask your question. <coughs> Unmute yourself. Nope. Okay, we had a, another question around economics, really, in terms of how how do these mixtures perform economically, and how um, how each of you are measuring that. Um, quite a big question, but just how how are you keeping track of, of how these perform economically? Perhaps you can kick us off, Andy. Um, well, as you saw with the um, the other one, is gross margin costs in and produce out, so. And there is there is other there is other outside factors to take in um, in terms of improving soil etc. Yeah. But yeah, that's it's got to be as a farmer. It's got to be economically viable. It's not not a not a fad or a fashion. So that's yeah. for for me. It also allows me to start growing niche crops. Hopefully with with, with less risk. So it's taking risk out of um, some of these crops and. See with the oats, hopefully eliminate the use of nitrogen fertilizer, which is another key thing I'm trying to do at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And as we were talking about with the liberation trials, it's kind of looking at how, trying to understand that impact at the whole rotation level as well, isn't it? Rather than just year on year. And that's where it gets a bit more more complicated. Have you got any thoughts on that, David, from your side? Um, we haven't done any um costings yeah I mean that's something I'd like to do this year um, from a research perspective doing that year on year is quite a difficult thing because each year the markets change so each crop will be valued differently and so your gross margins um, even though you might get exactly the same yield will change year to year so I guess from what we'll be doing uh, from this experiment is picking one set of figures so I think I'm planning on using the John Nix uh, farm management guide um, I'm picking um, gross margins from one year in particular and applying um, yeah all my figures to that one year so that you have a baseline um, set of figures to work with um, because if I was to do exactly the same thing the following year um, I could get much better yield but get a worse gross margin um, due to the nature of gross margins they're not the not always the most the simplest things to work out um, but yeah I, 
I'll uh, I'll figure that out when it when it comes around to it. But that's my ideas for the moment. Yeah. Great. Thank you. What about what about you, Adrian? Can I add to that? Yes, oh, please do, Robin. Yeah. Um. One of the things that we've been doing. Um certainly on our central field site is we've been growing spring barley as a carrier as a in the following year so we're looking at the residual effect of the intercrops in there and we've been looking at gross margins over two years and actually they quite often they stack up quite well when you look at it at that point because you can reduce things like nitrogen inputs and, and what have you in the barley absolutely so yeah, yeah we're looking at it, it rather than just the year that you've grown the intercrop it's really quite important to look at the the residual effect over perhaps one or even two years because we've found differences um, even in the third year after an integral particularly with a, a legume component in it. That's brilliant yeah are those results available somewhere that's really interesting. Um, yeah there's there's some information uh, it's been in, published in a um, um, conference in the past and things like that so yeah there's definitely information about there's some work that my colleague John uh, Badley was involved with as well, so um, we'll, we can maybe fish that out and see whether it, we can make it available. Brilliant, thanks Robin. I've um, got a question for Andy here. Has Andy found that he managed to reduce, we could just let you unmute your microphones now actually, rather than me controlling. Do you want to unmute your microphone, Mike, Peter? Andy, have you, have, have you managed to um, reduce, I know I, I met you last year, you managed to reduce some of your chemicals. Have you found that still ongoing by doing the intercropping? So, yes, um, we use very little in our beans and oats last year. We used very little fungicide, and it'd be interesting to see what happens in the disease trial this year to whether we need any. I don't know. It's quite high risk not to use any. Um, but in terms of nitrogen, I know you're asking about chemicals, but in terms of nitrogen, I think there's a massive saving. Um, but uh, in chemicals, yes, I don't think when you start mixing things together, you don't see issues of as many issues with pests and disease. Um, and that's, you know, that's where you, you'll spend more on seed when you're doing intercropping, but you'll save easily save that money back in less inputs. And for me, it's lowering the risk as well. If you have a bad, bad oat year or a bad bean year, the other one makes up for it. Um, so that's, that would be my, my simple answer would be yes. But it's yeah. not simple. Thank you. But we're still learning. We've got Isabel. Do you want to tell us a bit about what you're up to at Packer Herbs? Hi, everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, it's been fascinating to hear about your trials here in the UK. Um, Packer Herbs uh, is a tea company, and we um, source 140 tonnes of fennel every year for our teas, which is uh, a, lot, a lot of area. And our main uh, issue is recompetition and protein alkaloids that turn up in our fennel. Um, so this year in the region, we started to be in October, so it's underneath the fennel. So we had two trials region and first year. Thanks, Isabel. And yeah, and do stay in touch with us as well. And kind of these networks, um, that various networks like Diversify and Remix are working more internationally as well. So we're looking them up. Um, we've got Lenora. Could you tell us a bit about what you're up to with the strip cropping? Yeah, Hello. sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, I'll be quick. Basically, I'm working at Wageningen University in the Netherlands, and we're part of um, two projects, which maybe you, some of you interact with. One is Diver Impacts, and the other is Leg Value. They're both Horizon 2020 projects that are in the same cluster as Diversify and Remix. Um, so we, we, inter, we interact in various platforms. Um, and basically, what we're doing is a, a large-scale strip cropping experiment um, with 
uh, organic six year rotation of the top um, commonly grown organic crops common in the Netherlands. Um, so the main cash crops for organic farmers here um, in the Dutch landscape. And those are white cabbage, um, a winter barley, potato, a winter wheat, sugar beet, and uh, we have one year of a grass clover mix. Um, sugar beet is actually not a commonly grown organic crop in the Netherlands. There are no organic sugar pr uh, processors in the Netherlands, yeah. <laughs> but sugar beet in general is a really big crop for conventional growers in the Netherlands. So we wanted to try it in our experiment. Um, and we have a network of, um, uh, let's see, I don't know how many there are right now, at least two on station experiments that are each about five hectares um, and three or four uh, on farm trials, which are anywhere from one hectare to 50 hectares of strip cropping. And we try different strip widths depending on the location. The whole, our approach to strip cropping is that you can adjust the width of your strip um, so that you, you work the smallest possible width that your machinery allows for. Um, we think of it as intermediate technology for intercropping that is accessible with whatever machines you, the farmer has now. Um, so the idea is to make it as simple as possible. So on the farm that I work on most, we use a three meter wide strip, um, but we also have six meters and 12 meters and 24 meters being tested at, at different farms. Hmm. Um, and one of the things we do that's interesting maybe is that we always plant strips in pairs and we choose the crop pairs, um, sort of this matchmaking, plant matchmaking approach so that they should be ecologically beneficial to each other in some way. Um, because we're operating entirely organically, that kind of interaction is really important for, from our perspective. Um, and that's the main motivation for doing intercropping in the first place is to maximize on this, the complementarity and facilitation. Um, yeah, so we're, we try six or seven or maybe eight different crop pairs, which are based on just general hypotheses and rules of thumb about what should be good combinations. and. We're in the third year of what should be a six to 10 year long-term trial um, to measure a whole range of ecosystem services from those pairs grown in strips. And so far we have mixed results. <laughs> um, some pairs do really well together. Other pairs don't seem to like each other. They compete a lot. And for every indicator that we measure, there's a mixed result depending on the, the year and the crop. Um, it's all very variable. Um, but in general, the, the main finding so far is that as far as yields go, the strip yields are comparable with all of our large scale references. Um, so even though there's a lot of variability within the strips or between years, overall, it all kind of evens out. Um, is there so any indication in terms of strip width? Kind of differences within width? Yeah, the width also depends on the crop. Um, some things seem to like more of their own neighbors, like the, the cabbages, I think. Stella, maybe you can um, pitch in on this if you're still here. The cabbages seem to like to have more cabbages around them in terms of yield. Um, carrots, too. I think the root crops have a harder time competing with neighbors. Um, but for the cereals and the potatoes, I think the narrower strips are better. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, but so we can find the result more results on this on the crop diversification EU website or where do people go to, to follow? Yeah, I can I'll put it in the chat when I find it, but the the Horizon 2020 diversification cluster has a website and that links you to every one of the um, projects that are part of that, including like value and remix and diversity. Charlotte's just put it in the chat here. So yeah. Oh yeah, nice. Um, but also if you want to know about the, the actual on-farm trials, you can go to the Diver Impacts case study um, page, which I can also link, and that, that links you to every farmer that's trialing strip cropping and says a little bit about their farm. Fantastic. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Lenora. Yeah. Oh, the other great interesting thing, maybe you can briefly say about pixel cropping, because that's quite <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> 
Yeah, I mean, pixel cropping is another um, method that we're trialing that is is founded on this idea that so all the literature tells you that the narrower the strip um, or the the finer resolution of intercropping you have, the more benefits you should get theoretically, like in terms of yield and ecology. Um, so we thought like, okay, we're doing strip cropping, which is feasible with machines now, but what if we took it to the ecological uh, kind of maximum, most extreme, and split the strips into squares. So uh, the, splitting the field in the one direction and then again in another direction to make hundreds of tiny fields, um, which we call pixels. And then we plant those with all these same six crops that were growing in the strip. Um, in these random arrangements. Um, and right now our, our pixel trials, we have one trial where the pixels are 50 by 50 centimeters. Um, and then we have another farm trial where they're one and a half meter by one and a half meter. And we have no idea if this is <laughs> feasible in any way. Um, this is the first year we have a, a real farmer doing the trial. Um, so far we do it all ourselves by hand. Um, and yeah, we're, we're excited about it, but it's kind of a passion project because it has no real applicability in terms of um, realistic labor. Uh, but it could labor. be something kind of precision ag could pick up if, if it proved beneficial. Yeah. 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 Great. Well, we look forward to hearing more about that. Um, I'm conscious people are probably kind of hitting Zoom fatigue moment. Um, I think uh, we'll wrap up there. Um, thanks so much for everybody's for your contributions and your questions. I think um, we will probably look to organize something again further later on in the year um, and hear a bit more in terms of progress. Um, also with uh, Ali and, and the guys up in Scotland. Um, I just wanted to say that yeah, there are there's going to be all this will be on the agriculture website. We've also got a wealth of other videos and resources on there around intercropping. Um, if you're interested, do join our intercropping group. You can do that on the Innovative Farmers portal. So I'll send that around after this um, in an email. So you've all got links to that. And I think there's various kind of, of links coming up in the chat there. Um, and yeah, so thanks so much to everybody that contributed in your time. Thanks so much, David, for um, your virtual tour and helping us feel like we're out um, in the field today. Um, and yeah, if you've got any more questions, you can email me. Um, let's just all keep in touch. Um, and thanks for your patience. I know this isn't the same as being in the field, so um, well done them. for making it to two hours. I'll also try and keep that website updated on the Intercrop 2020 page um, just to keep, yeah, keep what I'm finding updated on that website. So if you have, if you wanted to follow what we're doing, um, then I'll attempt to keep it updated, but whether or not that'll actually happen is another story. But I'll also put the actual seed rates on there. I'll, uh, I'll get that up in a table because I think someone asked about it earlier. Fab. Yeah, thanks so much. Lovely. All right, well, stay safe, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. And um, yeah, we'll see you all soon.